Hi, and uh, welcome to the fifth annual 1455 Story Fest. This session is entitled Collaboration Poetry's Dirty Little Secret. My name is Allison Blevins, and I'm so excited to welcome the other panelists, Josh Davis, Megan Merchant, and Luke Johnson. We will begin with a reading of our work and then move into a roundtable discussion. Megan and Luke, you get to start. Okay, so I'll kick it off here. Um, Megan and I have been doing a call and response project. And in this exchange, I was the one who called. I also want to just quickly shout out, just to give them a little free press, the Stone Coast Review, which was a a magazine that I was really unfamiliar with until Megan's and my work landed in here. It's just a beautiful publication. So I just wanted to give them a shout. Um, <clears throat> so I'll begin here, and the, the piece is called Like Ruin or M. We could talk about the baby humpback who washed ashore with a belly of trash and a net used for catching thousands of fish. How children circle to see its foot skin flake in the sun of California and the birds so many of them rob flesh then raise it back like ruin one after the other after the other we could stand around watching the wonder dim as sea diminishes while parents snap photos and point and crawl into its gaping mouth to pull out giant teeth but yesterday while my daughter danced in a dead field flowers choked by soot my son came running with a bullet in his hand, and before I had time to take it, stuck it in his mouth and said it tasted like lemon. Kant would argue a seed of violence spreads in silence until it's too late, and a boy is beckoned to break apart beauty and scatter it. That as it blooms, his song diminishes and all chances of goodness are gone. That night, I put the bullet in a pocket of mud, and as I planted it, heard my son cry, the sting on his tongue, throbbing. Why am I telling you this? I stood before the shell of that beast on that day in July and whispered sorry as I told my son spit, his mouth flooded with ruin. I imagined its mother a mile off the coast circling her panicked calls nothing but shadows and shadows. Beautiful. Every time I hear you read that loop, I get chill. So I'll start with my response. Obituary. I thought of you and bullets in the husk of ruin we are feeding our children, saying, swallow, it will make you strong in the end. But I know. When I sat the other day with my own loneliness, as I have been taught, near people, but not, I listened to them ask about one of their group who was missing, dead, fell off a ladder. They laughed and it was true. One man said, I hope he suffered before he passed. He should have known better. Then they swapped stories of near misses and dumb decisions they should not have survived. Plugging a router into an amp, stringing holiday lights in the rain. I guess it's hard to know which side of balance we are on until it's not. I'd like to stay on the opposite shore of cruelty for as long as I can, which is why I was sitting alone why I'm teaching my son to swim, to keep his head bobbled above enough to breathe. The night my mother passed, I dreamt the town was flooded and she was alone in a room, wallpaper peeling as if the print of yellow daisies were windswept, not wilting. Mm. She was waiting in a wooden chair, a concerto echoing through the walls. When I asked, how long? She said, days, the water up to her knees. I was the one who carried her home. When I got home, I looked up the man's obituary and I kid you not, he was on that ladder trying to save a cat 
from a too high branch before the storm folded into flood? Do you think that he tasted lightning before it struck? What if the last thing we taste of this world are lemons, not bitter, not rust, but one placed in a white bowl on the counter, the light around it loudening yellow, the rush of juice dissolving to the last sprinkle of sugar, a kindness, a single note held on a violin. Thank you, Megan. Oof. It's hard. It's hard to go after that to to do anything after that. Uh, incredible. Um, so Josh and I are going to read next. Josh, here we go. Okay. Um, I agree with Allison that it's really hard to follow that, but I'm going to make an effort. Uh, the pieces that Allison and I are going to read come from a string of letters that are going to appear in our forthcoming book fiery poppies bruising their own throats, and that originally appeared in the Tahoma Literary Review. And maybe that's all I'll say for now. Dear Allison, I meant to write sooner. If only I could string words between tin cans like the cry owls hang in the night. I could find words to scorch your page. Do you remember years ago? how after treatment failed, I sacrificed my hair so you would have a child. I wish I had a single word for my certainty, dull silver, gleaming like the small scissors in a hotel sewing kit, that each ringlet cut close to the root was a spiral in the spell. Such arrogance, such glee. I need a one word way to catch. My father went to prison when I was nine. He was only gone a year, but his sentence was much longer. Do you have a thesaurus large enough? When I watched someone push a child into the world, I felt an envy, colder, smoother than porcelain, then uselessness. How sharply could men adore if they could kneel and bask in the cindery glare of what they cannot do, though my husband did. Forests burn. My mother has been dead for four years and I haven't spread her ashes. The singed trunks, kinless, will never return, whether or not I have known them. Every time I write, I love you, I hear, do what I want, when I want. No beauty promises an alternative. Cross-stitch blossoms spread, wine stains wide as a thumb. Dresses me in wounds, dress me in slivers. When we burn, we'll incandesce. I bet. Josh, I'm drunk again. Miscarriage. Is that what we should call it? I'm not sure how to even think. I keep imagining Sharon Olds and her drops like paint in the toilet. Something like that. You'd know her exact words. You always know. I laugh quietly, smile silently in crowds when it happens. Your quotations, you say, that's it, right? As if you are unsure, as if any of us might know better. Endearing. Pills too this time. I mean again. I mean, remember how I spent my 20s trying to die. That want flashes still in tight gold strings from my hair like holiday tinsel. That old question, what if? Imagine, imagine it. Here I am a directive. How the world would wake up again. How mourning and dishes and sweeping and hanging rugs to dry. This child would still be dead in my toilet. A poet friend told me today, I think I love you. I feel the same. I love you too. But here I am anyway. I want to cage grief in my hands with a swoop and clamp, trap grief glowing in a jar with, with grass and twigs. I want to wear grief like a, tie like a dyed electric blue wig. I want grief to rest gently on my shoulder as wings, ready for the melting. 
Where am I in the middle of this electric, skimming, cold, creped skin wearing grief? Josh, I want to say I am alone with it, but it is so dramatic. I can't manage the drama of alone. I meant this letter as an apology for being in this room again. Okay. So we're going to um, just have a chat. <laughs> and I want to start with uh, this question about process, because uh, every time we do a reading, somebody says, how do you how do you do that? I, I can't imagine writing with somebody. So um, just put it out there. What's the process like? So for Luke and myself, the we basically just send each other a poem, a call, and then the other sends each other a response. And then um, sometimes we look at them, we're like, wait a second, this feels like this was more of a response and yours was a call and we'll flip them around and, and work on them a little bit more from that angle. But I think it just begins with that kind of seed of inspiration and we'll text each other, email each other and be like, I'm gonna have a poem coming to you in a few days. And so it's this great gift of waiting. And when it arrives, we're like, okay, I'm gonna unfold this and then also unfold everything that I'm responding to in that moment, reading that poem. And so we write our own, uh, we do help each other very in a very limited way with editing, um, but it's a call and response kind of framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, this, um, there's this organic uh, flow that happens between uh, Megan and I, uh, it's really a <clears throat> poetically intimate experience in the sense that, um, like Megan said, I'm waiting for the response or the call and vice versa, you know, and, um, but there's no pressure. So it's, it's, it's the sort of wait, waiting game. And sometimes we'll write numerous four or five in a row, uh, because we're just both firing at the same time. And then sometimes life just I don't want to say get in the get gets in the way because life is the inspiration, but life does sort of take us away from the project for a time, and uh, that's what's sort of beautiful about our experience working together is there's this mutual understanding as parents that life is happening, and 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 so because of that, it's also created this kind of kinship and bond, as friends together, where uh, I'll just text text her and say. Hey, how's it going? What's what's going on? Is it, how, how, how's momhood going? You know, it's not always about the work. Um, and then somewhere in our conversation, one of us will bring up, hey, I have a response for you or that that response was coming. So mm -hmm. it's just been a real kind of beautiful organic process. I love that you, I don't know who said the word intimacy, but um, jo I think Josh and I were just talking about this last night and so for us the process is is definitely a little different we work in a google doc and um you know we work on no poem belongs to anybody i know i'll put in a title or josh will put in a few lines and um or you know i'll write something and then i put these blanks in and sort of hope it goes in and fixes it later um but so in that way I, you know, I think there's an intimacy that's created, like you said, as a friendship that's really developed. You know, we were friends before, but it's definitely grown. But I think there's some intimacy that I don't even know what the word would be for it. Like um, as part of the writing process that we're like in each other's process, like we're in each other's page. Does that make sense, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about that remark that you're right, folks do make, and I'm sure that Luke and Megan, you've heard versions of this, I could never, right? And people almost put their hands against their bodies, like they're covering something, right? And and um, and it, it seems to me that there are innumerable ways to collaborate, but but the way we do it is, is like, it's so close up. And I mean, in the same way that you'll sometimes put in blanks, I will write something that on the surface might look finished, 
but then I will write these scathing comments about what I have written. And I will say, this word is stupid. You'll find a better word. Do you see that? And I, I'm, I'm like immediately simultaneously tearing it down and inviting you to, yeah, I mean, I'll use your words, come, come along and fix it. Yeah. And, and there's an, there's an aspect of what you're describing, Josh, even in our process, uh, it might be a little different, but you know, I have my sort of obsessions and go-tos and Megan has her obsessions and go-tos, right? All poets do. And when, because this is a joint project, when Megan responds or calls, she is in essence world building from my piece. It's really our piece. And so she's challenged me in a really organic, beautiful way to not to, to, I don't want to say break obsessions, but I would say stretch my obsession. And uh, like, uh, that's just the best description I can give it is world build. You know, we're like world building together. And I might be, I might have gone to a go to for the next piece if it was just my project. But Megan will respond in some manner that just shocks me and surprises me out of that sort of self duper, if that makes sense. And we're all, it sounds like we're all building these really beautiful vulnerable worlds like that was the one takeaway from everyone reading i was just like i love you all for your vulnerability right now it's so it's it's so present and it's so powerful and i think that's one of the things that we're building too is that space to be vulnerable with each other and you guys are doing it just in a different fashion mm -hmm. i mean i don't want to put too fine a point on it but i disclose things when we are writing together that, I mean, I don't think of myself as cowardly in my single author work, not even close, but, but there's something about my little aesthetic cage that I've built for myself that doesn't always accommodate the kind of plain spokenness that I've really gotten into in, in, in the work that Allison and I do together. Like that bit where I say, every time I say, I love you, what I really hear is do what I want when I want. It's, it, I mean, I, I mean that, but I don't know how I would get that into, you know, like a, a villanelle or a sapphic or whatever the hell I'm up to. <laughs> how did the partnerships form? Because I think that's another question that people really want to know is how do I find a partner if I'm even interested in collaborating? Go for it, Luke. Uh... <laughs> I don't really have a how to guide on how to get a partner for this, but I would say uh, what helped Megan and I is we already enjoyed each other's work. So there was a shared, uh, we were fans of each other's work, let's just put it that way. And so there was this shared respect for each other. And then the way it happened for us, our, our, you know, if, if I get granular with it, the way it happened with us particularly is I had just finished my first book. Uh, it had gotten picked up and, um, I kind of posted on Facebook, what now, like a what now post. And Megan happened to hit me up and say, why don't we just try writing poems to each other? This is before we even thought of it being a project or, you know, becoming a book or anything. It was just, let's just write poems to each other and just inspire each other. And so that's how it happened for Megan and I. Um, but I would say if, if I was going to give advice, although I try to steer clear of that, um, there should be a shared, in my opinion, a shared respect for each other's work. And I think we had about a 10 minute phone conversation one day. Like, how are we going to do this? And I was like, oh, we're just going to write poems. Okay, cool. End of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, but absolutely. I think finding somebody whose work that really resonates with you, because uh, especially for me, the part that really works is that when Luke sends me a poem, I can feel it in my body just kind of ping all of these emotional centers and inspire all of these images and so I'm able to respond pretty fluidly so I'd say find someone's work that you definitely resonate that that resonates with you their work does yeah um and I've had a writing partner um before Josh and how she and I started writing together was, um, out of like a desperation after the MFA to, um, to get work made. And it can be really hard to, to 
to work when you're a mom or a parent or, um, and without that pressure of the MFA. Um, and so just sort of sending each other work and being responsible to each other in that way was super helpful. Um, but what she and Josh have in common for me was that they're both writers that, that I had thought, oh my gosh, if I could be more like them <laughs> in my mind, just this respect for the work that it was there, what they were doing was so good. And that I thought I had, could learn a lot from them. And it has been true, um, in, in the process. I mean, what we're talking about reminds me of, um, Louise Glick says something in a speech about the envy that resolves into admiration. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, we're, we're talking about this, I, I, I wish I could do that. Or, and, and I think I, I actually have learned how to do some of the things I hoped I could learn how to do, mm -hmm. in, including being more, more forthright and perhaps caring a little less about rhythms and syllables some some of the time some of the time oh so how else has um collaboration affected your own personal writing practices do you have more josh do you think oh about how our our um, yeah, yeah how partnership uh, came to form or, or no or about, about how, okay. right. how our collaboration has changed or affected your own personal writing I mean, maybe I've said this already, but when we write together, I say whatever I want. And I do think that's had a permanent impact on, on what I'm doing now. I mean, I still think I sound like me, but, but some kind of hesitation or, or reticence or tact or something has, has fallen away. You know, and I mean tact in the, in the least positive sense, the, the kind of tact that can, can, that can be a stranglehold. Mm -hmm. for me it's helped quite a bit to like luke had mentioned break through some of my like flood subjects right to stop writing about ravens maybe at some point and expand in another direction although i, I may not other birds perhaps <laughs> maybe yes um but being able to and i i actually am most comfortable on the response section for luke and so i try to think about that when I'm writing my own poems now of what am I responding to? So who am I writing to? Not just the generalized reader, who am I writing to? Um, specifically, how is whatever's influenced me at that moment having that same effect where I'm directly addressing it in, in a way that maybe I would not have before? I mean, I can get, there's many levels in which Megan's affected my writing. Um, I can begin personally, though. Uh, she's challenged me to rethink the way I view the world as a father. Um, mm -hmm. I can I can fall prey to a lot of fear. Um, just as I don't know, I, I just I don't want to overly, you know, genderize it or something. But just but just you know, it's a father. A father's instinct is sometimes to kind of protect and and uh, with all the you know, violence in our country and stuff, I can just fall prey to this agitated state. And um, Megan has not, it's not that she denied that in her responses to my work or her calls. It's that she brings this other sort of yin to my yang that um, reminds me to seek some levity and joy. Um, and so that's on, on a more personal level, but then that affects, of course, the writing. You know, my first book was, or is, is coming out in the fall, uh, I consider it like an exorcism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's an exorcism and it's highly syllabic and rhythmic and um, just like an exorcism might be. Um, and Megan writes this beautiful line, like this line that just scrolls and scrolls. And um, so on a craft level, she's, she's helped me. She's encouraged me to go that direction a little bit. And and it's no surprise that my second book that I'm working on now is still very much me, like you said, Josh, but uh, a little freer in the line, um, a little more magic from a levity standpoint, you know, and that's really from working with Megan. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting that you can like, it sounds almost like you can pinpoint 
and this is, I think I can definitely pinpoint and say, this is when I wrote this thing in my own individual work um, because of how it has like resonated or been influenced by what I was doing with Josh. And certainly our books together have really become this like um, way to get me out of that. I'm never going to write again funk <laughs> that like paralysis of I finished a project now what I'm gonna what am I gonna do and it's usually complain for a while and then Josh will like you know poke me and kick me until I start writing with him a little bit and then that will get me working also on my own projects but it's like I need him to pull me out of that funk before I can <laughs> create again um, like it's a nice hand to hold you when you're, uh, feeling all of that fear of creation. I wonder if for me, the other half of it is I want to talk directly to you mm. in a way that I don't want to talk to everybody. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I know we're not supposed to verbalize that kind of thing, but this is what I'm talking about. That's what I'm doing more of is like, there, there are elements in, in your voice that provoke me to respond. Mm -hmm. And when when that goes dead, I guess that's when I'm doing the, the prodding or the kicking or whatever I'm doing, because I, I, I want not just an audience, but, but you to be listening. Right. That might be a tip for finding a writing partner too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about someone that you want to to listen to your, mm -hmm. what you have to say. Yeah. What have the challenges been? For us, I feel like, and I don't want to speak for Luke, but just the same life challenges that we're presented with as writers who are also parents. Um, who are, you know, have uh, jobs or side hustles that have other side hustles, you know, um, I think it's kind of that, that ability to find the space and grace when we're not able to find the time. So I, I would answer it that way. I, I don't, I haven't experienced any actual challenges in the correspondence and the call and response process, only benefits. But I think that we're both kind of faced with that, uh, those parameters, those constraints that we deal with on a daily basis. Didn't want to speak. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's really that's really accurate. I would just add that um, <clears throat> Megan's like I I think I talked on that before, but just her some of her aspects of her work itself has challenged me to morph a bit as a poet and um, and see things a little differently. Uh, the challenge, of course, I would agree, would be, of course, we have so much going on in our lives, and and uh, but but like she said, because we set out not to create a project. I mean, this really, this whole project thing, like, this was never a project. You know, it was just something that became a project. Um, and so, be, because of that, there's no stress, there's no anxiety about it, there's no, hey, you owe me a response. In fact, right now, I've owed Megan a response for probably six weeks. Um, and I just haven't had it in me at the moment to get that to her, but I'm working on it internally and I will get that to her and there's no pressure. She's never hit me up and going, I'm going, Hey, where's it at, man? You know, so there's none of that. Josh, do we have challenges? Well, based on what Luke just said, I do feel like I'd like to clarify and say that this kicking and prodding I supposedly do never takes the form of you owe me a poem. No. That's not what you meant. So can you say, just for like my sake, will you say a little bit about that, please? Uh, I, you know, I am I think as any friend who's involved yeah. intimately in my life, yeah, uh, you know, I think a lot of times he's just like, Hey, how are you? And I'll think, uh, I really should be writing. <laughs> right. But I'm not saying no, anything. You're about not, you're not, but you know, I think I really, that's your role. You know, you are oh, my, right. yeah, yeah. but you're also my writing partner. Right. Um, and so I just think your like presence as a friend kind of always says like, uh, you know, 
in my mind, oh, I should be writing. And I actually just find that really helpful. Um, Because otherwise you might not do it is what you're saying. I might not, right. And, um, And I think too, you know, you and I will write back and forth and say, I... I really think this is an interesting idea for a book or I really have this, you know, I'm thinking about this flower or whatever it, it is. Right, right, right. And I think that's one way too. we prod each other. I mean, uh, Megan and Luke, I think I've heard you say more than once now that there was never a sense that this was going to become a thing. And Allison, I think if we're honest, we said, let's write a book. Yeah, we did. I, I think. mean, and we we did it. No, I mean, you know, I think we opened late, the dock. Yeah, we, late at night in the dark while the partners and the kids were asleep, you know? And it's because I can't do, you know, Sylvia Plath early in the morning before the kids are awake. I can't do that because the kids get up too early, you know, too early. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I also don't want to give off too much humility there. Uh, I think Megan and I probably knew if we're honest subconsciously that a project is going to be created that I'm well, glad because it's really I'm, good work. I'm really glad. Well, I'm just saying we were mercenary and said, let's make a book. I'm just putting that. <laughs> I think, I think, I think we tried to do the whole, we, we tried our best to do the whole humble, like, let's just write each other poems that nobody will ever see thing. But in reality, am I right, Megan? I think we're a little, yeah. we're, we're probably more knowledgeable of the fact that we really did want to, whether we said it or not at first, we, or I, I'll speak for myself. I figured it probably would maybe possibly form into that Mm -hmm. i i think it's okay to be truthful about that because megan when i hear you talk about what you feel when you get one of luke's poems i think to myself why would one not want that to to come to some kind of fruition i mean we we live in a world that makes so many demands on us and we're all parents, right? As we've as we've said umpteen times already, mm-hmm. and and that requires at least some sacrifice. If if you're any good at it at all, it requires some some kind of sacrifice. And I don't know how good at it I am. And so it seems to me like being able to admit to oneself, I, I think there's enough fire in this that that other people should at least for their for fifteen minutes pay attention to it. I think that's okay. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. that. I need more of that. <laughs> well, that might be all I have to offer, but I do think it's okay. <laughs> well, I think the question, like, what have the challenges been? And there, I, you, I mean, it doesn't seem like you've had many and Josh and I haven't either. And I, I mean, maybe we just picked really great partners to do this with too, because I, I think Josh and I had to be really willing how we were, how we write together to say, it's okay to just let go. Like to, if Josh goes in and deletes something, you just, you just can't care. And if, um, you know, if he, a lot of times I'll go in (laughs) and just revise. That's like, if I can't get writing, I'm just going to go in and revise and revise and Often it means making Josh's lines longer. <laughs> and yeah, he just no, has to be no. like okay with it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, in other words, there are there are features of this collaborative work that I would not wish for in my single author work. But but it is not that. It is distinctly not mine. Mm-hmm. It is ours. It is a separate thing. And it seems to me that the the we, Allison, that we have created, right? This little tornado of voices that we have created, they say things that you wouldn't say and they say them in a way you wouldn't say them. And they say things that I wouldn't say and they say them in a way that I wouldn't say them. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that like, we're, we're just trying to respect that we that we've fabricated. I mean, it's not real. That's why I'm saying fabricated. It's it's totally, you know, like all voices are. It's totally invented, mm-hmm. but it is distinct from you or me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you think, given all these benefits, clear clearly that we we all find, why do you think poets hesitate to collaborate? You know, Josh, how you said uh, people say, "Oh, I can't do this." vulnerability is hard it's scary I think 
making yourself that available, your life or your voice or your concerns that available to another person um, in whichever format it's done is really mm -hmm. terrifying for a lot of people. Um, it takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of, um, of openness and be able to hold that space for your writing partner. I think that's my take on it. Yeah, not to get too, you know, not to get my treatise on, you know, the poetry system in America, but do, I do think that there's a, I do think that there's a scarcity model uh, for poets in America. I think we all can agree on that, and and so there's so few prizes, and there's so little amounts of money, and there's so few chances to be recognized for certain work, and there's just so few. It's always so few, so little, so few, so few. You know, your chances are like 0.25% for this. And it's just like, there's just, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's a scarcity model. And and poets write oftentimes, you know, we're just stoked to, you know, sell a few hundred copies of something. And, you know, fiction writers are selling, you know, thousands upon thousands. And so, you know, some. When, when you, some, correct. So when you consider collaborating it really is cross-cultural in my opinion um as an american it's cross-cultural it's it's not about ownership it's not about self-success it's not about luke being recognized it's not it's about luke and megan's project being something that we can bring to people and it's this communion and it's shared and it's really, gosh, here I go. Oh my gosh, I should stop. It's very socialist in nature. Um, it's, it's not. I don't think capital. you should stop. Okay. So, you know, um, and so I, I just think even if someone wants that internally as say a poet, we've been cultured to, you know, feel and think otherwise. And so sharing with Megan in this experience is breaking that bread in half. Mm -hmm. uh, the rewards are tremendous um, in doing that, so especially as I speak from a soul level, a soulful reward. But but it's cross cultural when it comes to that scarcity model. Yeah. Has uh, collaborating altered your sense of um, what a poem is, or what a poem can do, or even a book? a really big question I I'm now so into collaborative work that's all I want to read <laughs> oh. so with books and what they can be I mean before you know all poems are being addressed to something to someone to this this idea or this person or something that's behind the curtain and when you have everything presented out in front of you on the stage to look at that's what I want I want to see all of that now Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of shaped for me what I want a book to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I can go back. Even the the last book that I've been working on, there's still letter poems written to an ancestor of mine. Mm -hmm. I still want that kind of, um, you know, that call and response and that everything's open and on stage in front of me and nothing's hidden behind that curtain. Right. Literal and figurative correspondence. Mm-hmm. Hmm. nailed it. it it's like the super teams in basketball everybody I wants to see I don't know anything see... about basketball well let me just try here <laughs> it's like everybody wants to see the stars the three or four stars play on the same team now that's the whole thing like and back in the you know back in the day it was all about one star on one team and they were going after each other and so I I, I agree with Megan I you know, like I have the second book that I've just stuck over here on the shelf because I'm so interested in our project and and now I'm looking for other projects like yours and I'm just wanting to see sort of these literary stars in my opinion just almost tag team this experience it, it's like why not bring more superpowers into the room um so forgive the sports analogy but that's the best thing I could, I could come up with is that that's sort of a, a reality right now in sports. People are wanting to see stars playing the same team. I mean, sometimes I ask students on an exam questions like, which two writers we've read this semester would you like to watch have dinner? 
you know, and, and what do you think they would talk about? And so like, I can't do sports, Luke, you know, cause I'm predictable that way or something. But, but my, my point is I hear you. And, and really what we're saying is like, instead of naming dead poets whom we can't watch collaborating quite this way, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just say to two poets we admire, like, please write a poem together just because that will amaze me. <laughs> right? You know, like, sure, Marilyn Chin and Ross Gay, you just get on that, you know, or whoever, you know, whoever is your idea of that, that dream team or whatever. I think because um, you write in form so much and I uh, don't. No. <laughs> ever <laughs> and uh you know your sense of uh what a line should do and can do is very different from mine that that has really um I think you know like it's kind of spread my wings a little bit in terms of you know because when I say I don't write in form like you often laugh because a lot oh, I of totally work. make fun yeah, of you and bust you, know, you a lot on of my work not has <laughs> you know highly formal elements and I think that some of that comes from you of like thinking that I could maybe do these things because I can see you doing it in our work and like watch the process too mm -hmm. because you know we can see it in the Google Doc that we're working in and um and so for me I think like watching again that intimacy of watching another poet's process of being invited into it has been really helpful and as just a learning process mm -hmm. uh, Luca, you were going to say something, I think. Well, I was just going to joke with Josh and try to make it, um, try to make it less sports and more cinema. Okay. It's like the movie. It's like the movie when uh, it's like the movie Jason goes to uh, was it Jason or was it Freddy? Freddy goes to hell. Freddy goes to hell. If we're talking classic horror, it, Freddy and Jason fought each other. I mean, and it, it was a terrible movie. But and I'm not saying that about our projects. Our fair projects are not terrible movies. But but the point I'm trying to make is, you know they made billions of millions of dollars on that movie because everybody wanted to see Freddie and Jason in the two iconic horror figures on the, at the same time in the same scene battling. Right. And, mm -hmm. or like the event, if, if we go with Marvel, people who love the Avengers, this group of four or five superheroes, I think it is similar in poetry. It's, it's like, why, why would we not want more superheroes on the same page? That's my perspective. That That's where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. um yeah mm -hmm. we're totally the poetry avengers it's happening <laughs> <laughs> well as we're coming to the end i really josh wanted you to speak a little bit to how we came up with the title of our panel in case people are wondering what the heck we were thinking <laughs> you mean like why we call collaboration the dirty little secret yes yeah i mean I, I just think it's because it's always been going on implicitly. And and Megan, you kind of said that you want it all out there, which inspires me to say that collaboration is just something that has always gone on perhaps behind the curtain, right? Luke, when you were talking about the um, kind of countercultural aspect of what it means to, to collaborate, I was I was thinking about how you know, coming up in an MFA program, I think can can sometimes encourage a person to uh, adopt this model that maybe began with the romantics, right? And, and continues with the modernists of the individual genius. And that has to be somehow protected. It's gotta be this sacrosanct thing and you don't want any um, chinks in it or something. And I think too, that we talked about poets writing letters to one another, right? When we were dreaming this up. And I probably talked about, uh, Sexton and Plath writing back and forth to one another. And one of them says to the other, after ha having seen some lines, if you're not careful, you're gonna out Rothke, Rothke. And then the other one writes back and says, you guessed it, you know? So it's, it's, so it's actually not even just Sexton and Plath in that conversation, right? But Rothke as well. I mean, with, without his permission, without his knowing, but, but him too. And like even Emily Dickinson, I mean, how many poems did she send to her sister-in-law, Sue? More than 250. 
And sometimes Sue would write back and say, you know, Emily, like actually stanza two is not as good as stanza one. Sometimes Sue was dead wrong, you know, but <laughs> since she was the love of Emily's life, sometimes Emily listened. <clears throat> and with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just thank you thank you so much josh and uh, megan and luke and um to the organizers of story fest for having us and to everyone who um is watching and um thank you for joining us for collaboration poetry's dirty little secret and be sure to check out all of the other sessions at 1455 story fest and we hope to see you next year. Thanks.